Hey, good morning. Wow, I feel like we all stepped into an elevator. Everybody was talking and getting along, and then all of a sudden it just got super quiet. I guess that means it is time to start. Um, Welcome everybody to the Bloomsburg Southern Baptist Church. So glad that you were all here today to celebrate our annual chili cook-off. Um, uh, if you're here today and you didn't bring chili, I want you to stay and enjoy the chili. You might think, oh, but there's only three crock pots over there and just one over there. Well, there's three out in the hallway and two upstairs and some are still coming in. So um, we have so much chili and uh, the beauty of it is this. We're going to put all, each of the chili on little numbered containers, and uh, they'll be just a super small little bite size. So you can, you can get all of the numbers, and you can just take a small little bite of each one, and then pick out your favorite. And what we do, I think we ask for your three most favorite chilies, and you just write down three numbers on a piece of paper that we'll give to you. And uh, from that, we'll get our first second and third um, uh, chili winners and uh, so we'll explain more of that a little bit later um, I have to do two things really quick um, one I have to let you know if you've not been keeping track the price of gold is absolutely outrageous so our coveted golden ladles have turned into silver uh, serving spoons so we have a first place silver ser serving spoon a second place silver serving spoon a third place silver serving spoon and a silver spatula for our cornbread for our favorite cornbread um, we also have another um, we also have another prize uh, on the baptistry I just want to talk about it right now um, yesterday was a wonderful day serving at the community friendship meal and so many people came out, I thought we were going to have more people helping than the people that actually came in to, to enjoy a free lunch. Um, my gosh, we had, I think we had like 21 people. So round of applause for Bloomsburg Southern Baptist Church. Can I tell you what warmed my heart? We had, we had parents, but we didn't only have parents, we had parents and children. Parents brought their kids, so kids were learning how to come and how to serve and how to be a part of doing something bigger than just their own little world. So that was super encouraging to me. We not only had parents and children, we had grandparents and grandchildren. And that was super cool to see grandkids helping out grandparents. I thought that was amazing. We had, we had young people, we had old people, and everybody had something to contribute. We had fast people. And we had very slow people. But there were jobs even for the slow people. The slow people had things to do. The fast people had things to do. The young people had things to do. It was, it was so heartwarming. And maybe one of my favorite parts of yesterday that uh, Cliff and Deb and my mom are in the Timothy Initiative. And we strategically, our job, we weren't moving very fast. Me, Cliff and Deb, we weren't very fast at all. Um, but what we did was we intentionally sat with the guests, listened to their stories, looked for an opportunity to share our story, and more importantly than that, we shared God's story. And, um, and so we made some really wonderful connections yesterday, um, opportunities to pray for people, and um, uh, it, was, it was a super, super uh, wonderful day. So church, thank you for stepping up. There's really, there's a place for everybody. And, and when we serve, um, everybody has a gift. Everybody has something that they're good at. And we need all shapes and sizes. And, um, and it, yesterday was just a perfect example. Now, we had a cookie decorating contest um, for our, our dessert at the community friendship meal was homemade cookies. And um, this is maybe the best story yet. Uh, there was a cookie there that looked so amazing. It was like professional, like you would, you would go online and you would buy this kind of cookie and it would come six of them in a box and it'd be like 25 bucks. Amazing. Everybody thought, that's gonna be the winner, that's gonna be the winner, that's gonna be the winner. But guess what? The winner was not that cookie. It was a cookie that was made with love. And when I heard the story, the story is this, the person who was making the cookies wasn't feeling very well. And so because the person who was making the cookies wasn't feeling very well, they needed the grandchildren to help them make the cookies. Oh 
And so they weren't all professional and beautiful and in a box with six for $20. Um, they, they were a little crooked and a little cattywampus and a little high and a little low and a, a lot of icing here and a little icing there. But each one was in the shape of a heart and you could tell it was made with love. And so I want to present the golden prize for the best cookies. And I'm going to steal a little hug because you're absolutely adorable. Thank you so much for helping today. Congratulations. You are the cookie winner. Yay! Oh, church, I can't say enough wonderful things about being a part of this community. I love you guys, and I'm so glad that God has brought us together to do the fun and crazy things that we do. We say at Bloomsburg Southern Baptist Church, we do church different, and, and we do, and each of us are different, and we are, and I just love that God has brought us all together and uh, to, to let us love him and show his love to others and, more, and, and feel his love. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to be your pastor. And I'm thrilled that today is Sunday. I want to say a prayer. And uh, as I do, I'll call the worship team on up. Um, and uh, yeah, let's pray together. God, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for this chance to start a brand new week. And to start it right in your house. And Lord, thank you for the opportunity to connect with you through prayer. Jesus, you said that your Father's house will be a house of prayer. And we say that, God, but sometimes we don't always reflect it. We get really busy and we get a lot of things that we have to do and a lot of things to get done. And, and sometimes prayer doesn't take up as much of the service is, is we say that it should. This should be a house of prayer. So God, I want each of us to start this morning right here as we begin this worship service together. Lord, help each and every one of us just in our own minds, from our own hearts, help us to just tell you some things that we're thankful for. God, would you just cause us to recognize things in our life that are good that we can say, thank you, God, for those good gifts. God, thank you for every good and perfect gift. Lord, there's things in our lives that we're thankful for. There's also things in our lives that we're embarrassed of. There's things in our lives that we're ashamed of. Because nobody's life here is perfect. And nobody gets it right all the time. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And God, we know that our sin separates us from you. But God, we want to feel close to you this morning. And so, Lord, we just want to claim the promise of 1 John 1, 9 that says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we can lose the guilty feeling. We don't need to be ashamed. Lord, you know our deepest, darkest secrets. You know every sin that we have ever done or thought or committed. And yet you still love us. But when we sin, we feel so far away from you. We don't feel connected to you at all. But God, we want to be connected with you this morning. And we want to be forgiven. We want to be freed. We want to be cleansed. We want to be empowered to do right. So God, would you just cause us, through the power of your Holy Spirit, just bring to mind some things that are keeping us from being close to you. Lord, help us to recognize those things as sin. Help us this morning just be honest, <coughs> just silently from our hearts, from our minds, Lord, to your ears. <coughs> help us to confess our sins to you.
God, there was a father who had two sons. One always did right, and he did good, and he listened, and he worked hard. But the younger son, well, he wanted his share of the money before his dad even died. So he said, Dad, give me, give me my inheritance. And, and the dad did because he loved the younger son. And that younger son went out, and he blew it all in wild living and doing really bad things. And he got in such a bind and such a pickle, and he came to his senses and said, even my, my dad's servants are better off than I am. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to my dad, and I'm going to tell him that I sinned. And, and I know that he probably shouldn't take me back, but I'm just going to ask that he would treat me like one of his servants because they're better off than what I'm at right now. And so the son got up, and he went back to his father. But before he got there, the dad saw him from a far way off. And the dad ran to his son. And he embraced him and he put clothes on him and shoes on his feet and a ring on his finger. And he welcomed his son home. And God, that just resonates so much that, that we are prodigal kids. And we go our way and we do our things. And then we get ourselves into a pickle and we cry out to you. And God, you don't condemn us and you don't criticize us. And you don't say, see, I told you you were going to fail. You run to us and you hug us and you clothe us. You provide for our needs. And that ring on a finger represents your part of the family. How we thank you, God, that you let us be a part of the family of God. Not because we're perfect, not because we get it right, but because we believe in Jesus Christ. Thank you for being our heavenly father. Thank you that we are the sons and daughters and the children of God. Thank you that you accept us. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Thank you that your grace is amazing. You give it to us when we don't deserve it. God, you are so good. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We pray that you would open our hearts, open our eyes, that everything we do this morning, from the prayers we pray to the songs we sing to the Bible that we read and everything that we do today, God, may it just draw us closer to you and closer to each other. Lord, fill this place with your presence. Let us know this isn't just a, a normal routine that we do. We're coming here this morning to meet with you. Give us eyes, Lord, that we may see you. Give us ears that we may hear you. Give us hands and feet that we might be obedient to what you are calling us to do. We ask this all in Jesus' name. All of God's children said, amen. If you're able, I'd ask you to stand with us. We're going to sing a couple songs this morning. We're just going to gather our thoughts and attention, and we're going to declare to God what we're here to do. We're here to worship Him. So this song is called, Come, Now is the Time to Worship.
come now is the time to worship come now is the time to give your heart come just as you are to worship come just as you are before your God come one day every tongue will confess you are God one day every knee will bow still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now come now is the time to worship come now is the time to give your heart come just as you are to Just as you are before your God. Come one day. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. the time to worship come now is the time to give your heart come just as you are to worship come just as you are me
And uh, worship team, I want us to uh, introduce a song to the congregation. So uh, we're not going to put the words up. We just want to sing this as a prayer. We want this to be an encouragement. And um, we, we really don't know this song. So uh, um, we, we just want you to, uh, we, we want you to listen. Hopefully we're going to do it the right way. It's a, it's a song that, have you guys heard about the, um, the revival that's happening in Asbury in Kentucky? It's a, a Christian school that has a, a weekly chapel service. They have a, I think just three days a week, they have a chapel service that the students are mandated to go to. I, I went to a, a, a seminary like that when I learned how to be a pastor. We had chapel services that we were required to go to. And sometimes it was just exactly what we needed. It was refreshing. Other times it was like, oh, we're required to go. We have to go. We really don't want to be here, but we have to go because it's what we have to do. Well, there's a particular chapel service that started on February 8th, and it's still going on. The chapel service never stopped. It's been going 24 hours a day ever since February 8th. And I'll tell you how it got started. It got started when someone came forward and just confessed their sin. You know, in the book of James, it's the Bible, the book of the Bible that we're studying. Well, we'll get to this in James chapter 5. And, and the Bible says, confess your sins to one another so you may be healed. Now make no mistake about it, we're, we're not of a Catholic faith where we feel like we have to confess our sins to a priest to, to get forgiveness from the priest. We only have to confess our sins to God because God, uh, by giving us His Son, Jesus Christ, who, who died for our sins, that's the only way to get forgiveness of sin, by believing and placing your faith in Jesus Christ, that He loves you, He died for you, He paid the penalty for your sin, that's why He died on the cross. And that's the only person that we need to confess to. But maybe, you, you, maybe you're kind of like your pastor. Maybe just like me, you got some pesky sins that just keep coming back. Areas of your, your life where you kind of stumble and fall and you, you try so hard, you work so hard, you want to overcome it. And sometimes the harder you try to overcome it, the more you just end up doing the same thing again and again. Well, James says, yes, only God through his son, Jesus Christ, can forgive us for sins. But he says, confess your sins so that you may be healed. Confess your sins to one another so you may be healed. And, and when we get to the point where we have a Christian brother or sister of the same sex, if you're a girl, you go to a girl. If you're a guy, you go to a guy. And, and you have a good relationship with that person. You say, man, I just got to tell you, man, I am just really struggling with this in my life. And I'm having a hard time overcoming this. Would you pray for me? Would you help me? And then you know what? That person is your accountability partner. And it, and it helps you not to keep falling into that sin because you know you got somebody praying for you. And it helps you to keep from falling into that same sin again because you got somebody that's there to check up on you. And like, you know, I want to keep going to my accountability partner and say, I failed, I failed, I failed. I want to have victory. And that accountability partner helps you to do it better. Well, on Fox News, because now the secular media is starting to realize there's a movement of God in the United States of America, and there's an exceptional outpouring of God's Spirit in Kentucky, and we want to send our news crews there to see what's going on. And when Tucker Carlson from Fox News did his report on this revival that's happening in Asbury in Kentucky... On that national broadcast, the song that they were singing in that chapel is this very song that we'd like to sing for you. This will be a miracle. <laughs> Let's worship the Lord. Do 
you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. It is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. kiddos. There are so many of you here today. Where's Miss Natasha? Miss Natasha, look how many kiddos you have for children's church. Do you have some special helpers with you, Natasha? Do you have some special helpers with you? Oh, I'm so glad. Well, Miss Natasha and all of her special helpers and all of the kiddos, you guys can go on up to children's church. You guys are going to have such a good time. The grown-ups have to stay down here and smell all the chili that's wafting through the air already.
um, before we start, I just want to say a, a prayer. I'd like us to join together, and I want us to pray for the Sharpless family. Um, Margo fell at her daughter's house on Valentine's Day or the day before, um, either the day before or Valentine's Day. The grandparents were going to give uh, gifts to the, the great-grandchildren. They were going to the great-grandchildren's house. And uh, Margot fell going into the house, and uh, boy, did she not get a big bump on her head and a, a blackened eye and a scrape on her face. And, uh, and to catch herself when she fell, she broke her wrist. But it, the wrist didn't just break the fall. It broke her wrist, but it also really injured her ribs and her back. And she is still a hurting pup. She was in the hospital for several days, um, but she's now recovering in the Bonham nursing home in Benton, and uh, um, it's a good nursing home that's run by a good family, and they really care for the people that are there, and so we're very thankful that, that she is there, but we're just, we want to we continue to pray for Margot that God would just remind her of his <coughs> presence, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share, I want us to also pray for little Tommy. Um, Tommy is the grandson of Joe and Lorraine Fiola, and um, uh, 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 over a month ago now, Tommy had gunpowder that ignited, exploded in his hand, and he lost a finger, and he's had many surgeries, and um, he is waiting, he's getting closer and closer to have a final surgery where they will do a skin graft where that finger is gone, the, the wound is not all the way healed, it takes a very long time for everything to come back together. And one of the last things that they have to do is put a skin graft um, over, over that wound. And it is so painful when they have to change the dressings. They have to go to Hershey Medical Center. They have to put him to sleep to change the dressings on a weekly basis because it's so painful. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to share a little bit in the, the sermon, um, a, a little update on Tommy. And uh, uh, show a, a little picture uh, or two, and um, I just I, I want us to uh, I want us to remember him and his mom and his dad and his grandparents and that family because that was a really uh, really tragic accident that happened for them. And so uh, let's pray for Margot together and let's pray for Tommy and his family. Now, don't listen to me on that. I want you to listen to that song. Don't listen to this prayer. You might not know Margot. That's okay. Everybody say Margot. Margo. Yes, that's who you're going to pray for. Uh, everybody say Tommy. I'm a Tommy. Yeah, that's who we're going to pray for. Say Tommy's family. Tommy's family. That's who we're going to pray for. Let's pray together. God, we pray to you because we believe in you. God, we believe that your son, Jesus, is sufficient to meet all of our needs. Margot and the Sharpless family has some needs. Margot needs to get feeling better. She's in a lot of pain. God, we pray that you would comfort her. We pray that you would heal and mend her body. We pray that you would strengthen her. We pray, Lord, that you would allow her to recover, to regain her strength. We pray, Lord, that you would ease her pain. We pray for Don. God, that he would be the support that his wife needs. We pray, God, that you would meet Don's needs. Margo's a really good cook. And Don doesn't have that right now. He told me he got some hamburgers he can fry. He made up some stuff. He, he actually even made a pot of chili. He was going to bring it in here today for our chili cook-off, but... Uh, he can't be here today. So God, we pray that you would strengthen Don. We pray for that entire family, that Sharpless family, all their youngins and grandkids and great-grandkids. The, the matriarch of the family has gone down and, and they really need her. So Lord, be a blessing to that family. May this be a, a bad thing in life, but may it be used for your good and for your glory. May this accident bring the family closer to you, God. May they cry out to you more.
May they see how real that you are and how you hear and answer our prayers. Bless that family. God, we lift up to you little Tommy, not even five years old. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to heal that hand. We pray for the trauma in his mind. A little boy dealing with so much pain is really difficult. We pray for his actions, just the the post-traumatic stress from something exploding in his hand. It's 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 a nightmare. It's something that he relives and And it causes anxiety and angst, and sometimes it causes him to lash out. He doesn't know how to process his feelings. God, would you not only heal his body, but would you touch Tommy's mind today? Would you help bad dreams to stop? Would you help a a new day, a bright light, a ray of sunshine to, to come through to his life where, God, that was in the past, and now he's here, and he's moving forward. God, would you do a miracle like that in his life? For his dad who feels so guilty, would you remove every ounce of guilt? Would you let his dad just say, I I don't know what happened. I don't feel guilty anymore. When that happens, God will know it's because we've joined our hearts in prayer for that man. Would you strengthen his mom? The one who drives all that time to Hershey and has to be there for every bit of pain for her son. And when her son hurts, she hurts. And she probably hurts so bad. God, would you take that pain off of his mama? She holds it together. She is a rock. And God, we thank you for that. She is there to support and encourage her son and help him in every way. So, God, we pray that you would support and encourage and strengthen grace. That's Tommy's mom. She's amazing. God, give her amazing grace and strength to be that little boy's mama. To be strong for him when she needs to be strong. To be tender when she needs to be tender. And loving and caring and forgiving. Full of grace. Because a little boy who's hurting and acts out, he needs grace. God, that whole family full of grandparents and cousins, aunts and uncles, they all just hurt. God, I pray that you would just give a release to them that the weight that's on their shoulder and the burden that they bear, God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would release all of that. That you would touch that family in such a strong and powerful way. They would feel you and know that you are real, that you did a work in their lives. God, this is our prayer. We believe in you and we put our faith in you. Answer this prayer in Jesus' name. All of God's children said, amen. Oh, just need a second. Could you maybe just mute this real quick? I want to give a good hard blow. Mike probably came on just in time for that cough. All righty. Well, gang, you'll be happy to know it's 1133 and my sermon is only six and a half pages long. You're like, six and a half pages, Pastor? That's a lot of pages. Yeah, but did I tell you this? Since I don't have my glasses this morning, we're at size 18 font. 
So you could, you could probably read it. I could just do this right here like they do in those videos on the interwebs, you know. I could just do this and then do this. You could just, you could just see it all. You really could. I won't make you read it. I'm going to give it to you. If you have your Bibles this morning, would you again open up to the book of James? We're going to be in James chapter 2 this morning. So we're in this sermon series. We're just going section by section through the book of James. Today we come to chapter 2. This whole series is called Developing a Faith That Works. One of these days, Lord forgive us, I'm sure we're going to play George Michael's little guitar rift. And for those of you of a certain age, you're going to hear that guitar and you're going to be like, you got to have faith. Boom, 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 boom. It's just, we're just going to do it because we got to have it. We got to have faith. Today we're going to look at this. Our sermon title today is called How to Have Real Faith. Because there's a lot of phony religions out there. There's a lot of people who think that they're Christians, but they're really not. Some people think they're Christians because they live in America. America's a Christian country. Well, it used to be. It's not so much anymore, is it? In our passage today, James talks about the difference between real faith and counterfeit faith. We don't want counterfeit. We want the real thing. So we're going to talk about how to have real faith. Our, our text is James chapter 2, verses 14 to, 20, uh, 14 to 26. And um, this is a really, it's a controversial passage in the book of James. And it's often misunderstood. Um, you see, there's, there's misguided people who try to use this passage that we're going to read today to prove that you have to work your way, work you have to work your way into heaven. And you don't have to work your way into heaven. The entire New Testament teaches that you're saved by grace through faith. It's, it's grace and faith alone that, that saves a person, not, not works. And so let me put a passage up on the screen. I want to I just kind of uh, give you a, a difference between what the Apostle Paul says. We're going to look at that before we look at what James says. So in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, know that a man is justified, excuse me, I misread that. The Apostle Paul says this, know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Folks, you can't be good enough to get into heaven. And, and so many people think, you know, when I get up to heaven, I just, I just hope that when God's weighing on the scales of justice up there, that I got a little bit more good than I do bad. So many people, that's what their hope is in, that they do just a little bit more good than bad so they can get into heaven. And that's not what gets anybody into heaven. Nobody gets into heaven by doing more good than bad. Nobody gets into heaven by observing the law. We're saved by faith in Jesus Christ, not by observing the law, not by keeping rules or regulations. Now here comes along James in chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. James says this now. In contrast to what we just heard Paul say, James says, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food... If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well. Keep warm and well fed. But does nothing about his physical needs. What good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that 
faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Look on your outline. Who's right? James or Paul? Well, the answer is this, both. They're both right. They're both right because they're talking about two different things. Look on your outline. I put something here on your outline. Paul was fighting the problem of legalism. The problem of, I've got to keep all the Jewish laws and all the rules and regulations to be a Christian. Paul's talking to that group. Paul's talking to that group of of Jewish people that that were being legalistic and thought that they had to get God's favor by keeping all the rules and all the regulations. And on the other hand, James, James is, uh, he's not fighting legalism. James is addressing laxity, being lazy. Those that say, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you believe. Laxity of faith. Paul and James are talking to two different groups of people, and they're talking about two different things. But they both use the same word. They both use the word works. But they use it in different ways. When Paul uses the word works, he's talking about the the Jewish laws, like the the. The, the Jewish boy has to be circumcised on the, the eighth day. Um, uh, you have to wash your hands in a certain ceremonial way. There's strict dietary laws that, that have to be followed and, and things like that. Paul's saying it's not about those rules and those regulations. It's not by those works. Now, when James uses that same word, works, he's talking about the lifestyle of a Christian. He's talking about acts of love. Loving people, caring for people, meeting people's needs. And it's totally different. They're two totally different things. So Paul focuses on the root of salvation. What happens internally. And James focuses on the fruit of salvation. The the external things that happen on the outside. Jesus said... By by their fruits, you will know them. Paul's talking about how to know that you're a Christian. James is talking about how to show people that you're a Christian. Paul's talking about how to become a believer. James is talking about how to behave like a believer. This is not a contradiction. This passage in James does not contradict that you are saved by um, grace through faith. James is not contradicting that at all. Point number two on your outline, what is real faith? How do I show that I'm a believer? James says there's five ways that you can know that you got the real thing. He gives us five steps or, or principles here in this passage. Number one, real faith is not just something you say. It's not just something you say. Real faith is not just something you say. It's not just something you talk about. Verse 14 says, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? Notice it it doesn't actually say that the guy has faith, but he claims to have faith. He he talks about it. He knows knows the right phrases. He knows the right sayings. There's a a lot of people who claim to be Christians. 
But Jesus said, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Can such a faith save him? What value is this kind of faith? It has no value. Talk is cheap. You, you can say the right words. But if your actions don't accompany your words, it doesn't really matter, does it? Talk is cheap. Real faith is not just something you say. Number two on your outline. Real faith is not just something you feel. Well, I felt it this morning. I felt the Holy Spirit moving. It made my eyes water. It made my nose run. It made little goosebumps stand up on the back of my neck. But real faith is not just something you feel. Faith is more than emotions. A lot of people confuse emotions and, and, and sentiment with faith. You can be emotionally moved. You, you can get goosebumps in a church service. But it doesn't make any difference because it doesn't change you. You walk out being the same person, doing the same things, the same wrong stuff. You can have the goosebumps and the, the, the quiver in your liver. You know, you get all excited. But, but if it doesn't change who you are when you leave, it's, it's not real faith. It's more than something you, you feel. James gives us an illustration in verse 15. He says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says, go, I wish you well, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is that? What good is that? Real faith is more than just sympathy and, and feeling emotion. You, real faith is when you do something about it. You act on it. Real faith takes the initiative. A real believer has real faith and it's real practical. They do practical things to help, to love, to care, to be involved with other people. When you become a part of God's family, you've got some family responsibilities. A real believer will care about other believers and, and do something for them. First John 3.17 says this. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Real faith is generous. It wants to give. It, it wants to help out somebody in a crisis. First John 3.14 says, one of the proofs of your salvation is that we love other Christians. They will know we're Christians by our love. Do you love others? Do you care for others? Do you help others who are in need? Can, um, I'm going to put you to the test here. Can you look through, go all the way to the end. There's some pictures of, uh, of, uh, of a little boy. Uh, I think it's a basket. It's a basket of some stuff. If you can find that, put that up there. I, I love our church. We've been talking about Tommy for a long time. This, this morning we prayed for Tommy and his family. But you know what? We, we put out a need a while ago, and you guys responded. And uh, this was things that you guys went out. You, you're like, hey, I was at the store. I thought a little boy might like this. We, we wanted to give some gifts to little Tommy. And uh, we wanted to provide. We, we, we asked for, you know, it, it costs money um, to drive to, to Hershey from Benton to Hershey. It takes, it takes some, some bucks in gas money. And, and if you're driving that far, you've got to get something to eat. Even if you're just going to Sheets and getting an MTO, it's costing you some money. And, uh, and so we wanted to just bless that family. So we got them some gift cards. And, and, and some people um, found out that Tommy loved monster trucks. And, and I don't know if you can see it up there, but there's a, there, there's, a, there's a grave digger in there. But it's not a plastic one. It doesn't make noise. It's a pillow. And so here's a little boy that loves monster trucks, but he's hurting. He's got an owie. And he hurts. And so what does he get comforted by? His favorite monster truck. But it's soft and, and cuddly. And, uh, and I want to show you something else. Can you go to the very next one? So here's a text that came through. And, and it says, I, I wish I had a video of Thomas when he came to our house and saw the basket full of things. He just kept screaming in delight, saying, I'm so excited, I'm so excited. He loves it all, especially the monster truck blanket and pillow. Thanks again for everything. And here's the follow-up text. This is from Grandma. 
And uh, Grandma says, when we mention people that, that give him things, he says, are they praying for me? And we say, yep, every day. She says, what a kid. Are they praying for me? Are they praying for me? As often as we think about it, I showed you that picture because I just want it to stay in your mind. As often as you think about that picture, that picture comes into your mind, I want you to act on it. I want you to say a little prayer for Tommy. If, if this, this picture, this text just pops into your mind, you're like, you're out today, you're doing something, you're going for a walk later on this afternoon, and you're like, what was that, that black slide that had all the writing on it? It didn't look like all the other ones. When you think about that black slide, you think about Tommy, and, and you say a prayer for him. We'll continue to pray for him. He continues to hurt. If you're thinking about that, then you're like, wait a minute, didn't we pray for somebody else? Oh, yeah, that Margot lady. I remember her name. I said it out loud, Margot. When you think about Margot today or tomorrow or coming up ahead, act on it. Don't just feel bad for her. Pray for her. Pray for Tommy. Because real faith is not just something you feel. All right. Do you remember where we were? Can you get back to where we were? You are so awesome. We can meet everybody's needs. No, actually, we can't. We can't meet everybody's needs. But we can meet some people's needs. Jesus is saying that if my faith doesn't lead me to share with others, it's wrong. Verse 17 says, in the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. If we don't feel like helping other Christians, we have a sick faith. If we don't feel like helping other Christians, James 17 says we have a dead faith. So is that real? James is laying it on the line here. He says, do you want to have real faith? It's more than just something you say. It's more than just something you feel. Here's number three on your outline. Real faith is not just something you think. For some people, faith is an, an intellectual trip. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter to be studied, uh, debated, talked about, discussed. So James imagines this intellectual objector. In verse 18, he says, some will say, you have faith, I have deeds. He's imagining some intellectual guy who says, yeah, you're into faith, well, I'm into works. Different strokes for different folks. Let's debate it. Let's talk about it. You got your thing. I got my thing. Let's just all get along. James says, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. Show me. He says, show me. Real faith is visible. You can see it. Real faith is visible, and you can see it. It's apparent. If you claim to be a Christian... People will be able to see it. It'll be visible. It'll be, a, it'll be your lifestyle. Somebody said, faith is like calories. You can't see them, but you sure can see the results. <laughs> Terrible thing to say on chili cook-off day. <laughs> Second Corinthians uh, 5.17 says, anytime a person becomes a Christian, he becomes a new person inside. The old things have passed away, all things become new it doesn't happen overnight we're all a work in progress we don't get it right the first time God's still working on us but when we turn to Jesus when we believe in Jesus the old is gone and the new has come number four on your outline real faith is not just something you believe he says you believe there is one God good even the demons believe that and shudder. Just saying I believe is, is not enough to get you to heaven. Even the devil believes in God. The devil believes in God. The devil knows more about God than you do because the devil's been around for a really long time. He believes, his demons believe, and they shudder. 
They shudder because they know the majesty of God. They know the holiness of God. They believe in God and they tremble because they know he's real. The word believe in Greek, it means to, to trust in, to cling to, to rely on, to commit yourself completely. Real faith is more than just believing. I, I believe in Hitler, but I'm not a Nazi. I read, I studied. It's because you believe in something, it doesn't make you that thing. Christians can It's more than just believing. Real faith is not just something you believe. It's more than that. It's more than just knowledge. You got to have knowledge, but you got to have heart. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But this is a combination of knowing it with your head and also believing it in your heart. When you believe something in your heart, that's faith. You're saved by grace. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. God just gives it to you. Right? But you got to receive it. You got to believe it. You got to believe by faith. It's not just something you say. It's not just something you think or feel or believe. What is real faith? Number five on your outline. Real faith is something you do. In the next couple of verses, James gives us two illustrations that that say what, what faith is, what real faith is. It's something you do. Faith is something that's active. It's not passive. Real faith is a commitment. Two illustrations. He gives two different people, two very, very different people. Abraham and Rahab. Opposite extremes. Here's some things. Abraham's a man. Rahab's a woman. Abraham is Jewish. Rahab is a Gentile. Abraham is a patriarch. Rahab is a prostitute. Abraham is a major character in the Bible. Rahab is a very minor character in the Bible. He uses these illustrations to say, it doesn't matter who you are. As long as you've got the important thing. They only had one thing in common, and that was their faith in God. It doesn't matter who you are. Do you have faith in God? More than just knowing about him with your head. Do you believe in your heart that Jesus is God's son? That he died for your sins? That he rose again? Verse 20 and following, James says, You foolish men, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? His faith and actions were working together. His faith was made complete by what he did. Scripture was fulfilled when it said, Abraham believed God. How do we know it? We saw it. We know that Abraham believed God. We saw it in a visible way. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. Now, you know the story. This is the story of Abraham. It's the ultimate test where God asked Abraham to give up his own son. Now, this had nothing to do with Abraham's salvation. Abraham was already a believer. 25 years earlier, God had said to Abraham, you are righteous. He's not talking about Abraham being saved by his works. He's saying that it just shows how much you believe. Abraham obeyed God. It was immediate. He followed him. God said, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac. Abraham listened to God and he was prepared to sacrifice his son. 
But before he could plunge the dagger into his son's heart, God provided a ram in the thicket that could be a sacrifice so he didn't have to sacrifice his son. Abraham said to his son while they were walking up the mountain, he said, we will return. He didn't say, I'll return, I'll go back down the mountain. He said, we will return. He knew that God would provide something, somehow. Even if it meant raising his son from the dead, Abraham knew that he and his son were walking down off the mountain together. God was testing Abraham to see if he would do what he was asked to do. God asks us to sacrifice, not our children, thank God. God says there's things in your life that you need to die to. Do we trust God? Do we listen to God? Do we obey God? He talks about Rahab. There's a story in Joshua chapter 2, the story of how a prostitute helped a couple of spies when they were coming into Jericho. And, and Rahab ends up in the family line of Jesus. In, in the Gospel of Luke, when it talks about the genealogy of Jesus, Rahab is in that line. Amen. Yeah. Our faith is not determined by what we do, it's demonstrated by what we do. Talk is cheap. Put your money where your mouth is. I believe in Jesus. We'll prove it. (laughs) Our faith is demonstrated by our actions. Actions speak louder than words. When there were 21 people serving at the community friendship meal yesterday, that was our actions speaking louder than our words. I was so proud of our church. Do you know how many people said, this was such a good meal. I, I, I take a, a healthy pride in that. Our church is awesome. Put our money where our mouth is. Our actions speak louder than words. We, we showed God's love to people. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. So let me land the plane here, bring this sermon to an end. Do you have real faith? Are are you hoping to get into heaven by doing more good stuff than bad stuff? Because it doesn't work like that. You can't get up there and just hope to have a little bit more good things on the scales of justice than bad things. Because, you know, how do you know how much good is enough to do? Isn't there always somebody that does a little bit more? How do you know when you've done enough? You can't do enough. You can't earn God's love. God loves. The Bible says, God demonstrates the extent of his love. While we were still yet sinners, he sent Jesus to die for us. God doesn't love us because we're good. He loves us because we're bad. He loves us because he knows we need a way to get to heaven. We can't get there on our own. So God sacrificed his one and only son, Jesus. And whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's not by what we do. We can't do enough. We can't be good enough. We can't earn it. But God freely gives love and grace and mercy and forgiveness and the power of the Holy Spirit, and an abundant life here on earth. But we have to reach out and take it. We have to accept it. And we do that by faith. God gives it by grace because we don't earn it. We have to receive it by faith. Sure, there's things that you've got to know. But you've got to believe it in your heart. You've got to take that step of faith. And so now that we're talking, what is real faith? Just examine yourselves. Think about your life. Think about what you do. Think about what you say. Think about the jokes that you tell, the people you hang out with, the movies that you watch, the hobbies that you have. Can people see God's faith in you? 
Can they see his love in you by your actions? Not just what you think, not just what you feel, but by what you do. Not just what you say. Talk is cheap. By what you do. Now listen, let me just reemphasize one last time. That James is not saying you have to do things to earn salvation. He's saying you do those things to show your salvation. Can you point to changes in your life? Uh, a lifestyle that's different than unbelievers? Or do you live exactly the same as unbelievers do? Some people think it's, it doesn't, doesn't matter what you do as long as you believe, but that's not true. You don't work your way into heaven. Works don't deliver you salvation. Works demonstrate your salvation. That's what he's saying. Do you, do you do things in your life that demonstrate your salvation? It was just a free gift that God gave to you. Maybe some of you today need to receive that gift. Maybe some of you just like the light bulbs clicking and it's like the first time you're like, whoa, wait a minute. I, I don't get into heaven by being good? No, you don't. <laughs> you can't be good enough. So how do you get into heaven? It is by grace that we're saved. Through faith. It is the gift of God, not by works. So that any of us can brag. Whoever believes in him. Not just knows about him. But believes with their heart. Whoever accepts Jesus by faith. Will not perish but have everlasting life. What, what exactly do we believe? We have to believe that we're not perfect. We have to believe that we mess up. We have to believe that we're what the Bible calls a sinner. Nobody's perfect. The Bible says we're all in the same boat. You know, there's so many differences in the world today. Let me tell you something we all have in common. We all sin. <laughs> we all fall short. Nobody's perfect. That's what we all have in common. The Bible says that the penalty for, for sin is being separated from God forever and ever and ever. But God loves us so much, he doesn't want us to be separated from him forever and ever and ever. So God chose to give this world his one and only son, Jesus. You know what Jesus did? Jesus paid the penalty for sin. The Bible says everybody sins. Yeah, I can agree with that. The Bible says the penalty for sin is death. God said, I'll send my son to pay the penalty. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. To pay the penalty for sin for everybody. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for people in the Old Testament that were born and lived before Jesus was manifest and come to earth. Jesus died on the cross, not just for people who came before he was born, but Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sins for people like us who came along after Jesus lived and walked on this earth. Jesus paid it all from people in the past to, to people in the present in Jesus' day to people like us in the future. That's us. And when Jesus died on the cross, he took the guilt, he took the shame, he paid the price, he paid the penalty, the penalty of sin is death, and he took all of that sin, all of my sin and your sin, and the whole entire world, past, present, and future, he took it all upon himself, and when he got every last sin that everybody did imparted into him, every last sin he died for, and then he said, it is finished. And then he gave up his spirit and he died. After he had paid for each and every sin of all mankind through all time. He paid it all. He said it's finished. And then he died because that was the price that had to be paid. Thank God. Three days later, 
he arose. Did you ever hear it like that before? Did you ever hear the message like that before? You know about the cross, that's a Christian thing. Do you now see why Jesus died on the cross? He did it for you. <laughs> he did it for the world. He did it so we could not only know about it with our head, but believe it in our heart. That's how we're saved. By acknowledging that we are imperfect. Acknowledging that Jesus is, that he died on the cross for our sins. And then receiving that and saying, I believe in you, Jesus. So you can know for sure today. It's not by your works. It's not by doing more good than bad. You can know for sure today. This can be your spiritual birthday. This can be the day that you know that when you die, you're going to heaven. Because you believed in Jesus. Would you believe today? Let's everybody bow our heads together and let's pray. God, thank you for this amazing gospel message. This is good news that God loves the world. God loves everybody. God doesn't hate anyone. He loves us all. And he loves us and made a way for us to be forgiven and have everlasting life. And that way is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So God, today, within the sound of my voice, if there's someone who does not know for sure that they're going to heaven, Lord, would your Holy Spirit just draw them to you this very day, at this very moment. Help someone to acknowledge, I am not perfect. I do mess up. I do wrong. I need to be forgiven. Jesus, I believe that you paid the penalty for my sin. I believe that you died for me. I also believe you rose again. So today, not just with my head, but in my heart, I believe it. And I, I say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Please save me. Please forgive me of all my sins. As best as I know how, help me to live for you, to do what's right and keep working on me, God. Change my heart, God. You died for me. Jesus, help me to live for you. Change my actions. Change my thoughts. Change what I say. Change me, God, from the inside out. And help me to follow you and to love you because you gave everything for me. So help, you, help me to love you with all that I am. I trust in you. And I thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Now help my life to show the faith that I have. Help me to be more patient with other people like you're patient with me. Help me to love other people when they're jerks, just like you love me, God, when I'm a jerk. Help me to be more caring. Help me not just to feel sympathy for others, but help me to do something. Help me to pray more. Help me to have greater faith. Help me to, to believe in you more. That when I pray, you listen. God, help me to believe that what I pray, you will do. Give me that faith. Let my life show that I'm saved. I trust you that I'm saved by grace through faith. But help my life show it to others by what I do. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this message of hope. Help us today, not just to be hearers of the word, but to be doers. In Jesus' name we pray. All of God's children said, amen. So it is 1213. I know that because your bellies are grumbling and I can hear it. Just sit tight for a minute. We got some 
people that are going to, so like, I mean, let's stand up. Let's stand up and stretch our legs. You need to go outside. If you need to go and you can't stay for a chili cook-off, that's your loss. We invite everybody to stay. We got so much chili. Just don't stay around too long because we all know what happens after we eat a lot of chili, right? We'll get you out of here soon enough, okay? But uh, just let some things, some more chilies coming in. We're going to get it all, all put into little cups so we all can do a tasting. We all can do some judging. Um, we got a whole team of people that's going to start working right now. You can get up, stretch your legs, use the restroom, and, uh, and, and we'll give you some instructions, just a little bit about how we're going to do this chili cook-off together. God bless everybody.